who will kick things off and make some introductions. Thank you very much. And welcome to Making AI Real, How Data Determines Your AI Success. Now, we probably should have started with there's oceans of data out there and we're all trying to do something with it. And the latest, greatest technique for harnessing that is artificial intelligence. So today we are privileged to have the dream team of AI and ML ops. And I want you to meet each of them individually. Let's start with Tarek Dwerk from Snowflake. Tarek is the Director of Technology Alliances. He spent 20 years in the high-tech industry with software development, sales, and business development. Prior to Snowflake, which is the unicorn in the industry right now, Tarek managed strategic partnerships at AWS and EMC. He spent more than 12 years at EMC in pre-sales roles, managing enterprise accounts and leading technology strategy for EMC's global accounts. The other, the other person we have from our partnerships is Doug Bryan. And Doug is an AI strategist with Data IQ. Doug's a technology adoption sales and innovation specialist with experience from Amazon.com, Accenture Labs, Stanford University, various ad agencies, and a whole host of startups. And he has a wicked sense of humor. So let's listen for that as he talks to us today. Then there's Kelly Kalafel, Vice President in Sales, of Mar in sales Marketing and Alliances at HashMap an NTT data company. We recently acquired HashMap to augment the services NTT does. Kelly leads a team of innovative technologists and domain experts who accelerate the value of data to the cloud, I IoT, as well as IIoT, AI and ML customers for customers across industries and the community. His team provides outcome-based consulting services, managed services, and acceleration services as part of the NTT data. And finally, I'm Theresa Kushner from NTT Data Services, the company that brought you the Shark Dive event that you just went through. Today, we're going to engage these three experts in a conversation about making AI real. Because in some of the facts and figures that we've collected, only about one in six AI projects ever makes it into the business to begin bringing value to the company. At NTT Data, our goal is to democratize artificial intelligence so that it makes it into everyone's organization, so that anyone in the organization that needs those capabilities for making decisions has access to it. So let's get started by talking to the panel. Uh, Tarek, Doug, and Kelly, here's your first question, and we'll start with Tarek. Why is business strategy critical to a successful AI implementation? And all three of you are going to answer this question so we can get your inputs. Yeah, thanks, Teresa, and hello, everyone. I, I think what, what we see is there's this intense pressure for every organization to, to leverage AI across the company, and because of that intense pressure, Companies tend to jump right in, and uh, and there's also a tendency to to jump in without fully understanding which problems to solve that are best aligned to the business. Uh, what they want to do in most cases is look at what are the applications that are most customer facing or um, most most flashy, um, without understanding if if the impact of the application or the complexity of the application is actually going to allow them to succeed, and are they are they actually addressing more underwhelming business challenges. And the end result in most cases is a failed project because they got minimal overall, uh, they, they got minimal overall impact and minimum adoption. You don't want to build a solution for the wrong problem. You want to identify the problems that have the most upside. And, and what that involves is planning ahead, right? Not just jumping right in, uh, taking the time to interview and research on, across the entire organization and talk to a lot of stakeholders. Uh, I'll give you a real world example. We, we had uh, this one company that, um, just like all companies, were, were challenged with a specific problem around customer retention. They were losing customers at a pretty quick pace. Their customer satisfaction scores were, were poor. They were declining. And they said, we're going to leverage uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning to address this problem. And right away, they wanted to, to go at the consumer-facing app right, and look at, hey, how do we improve a, uh, the customer experience? 
And luckily someone had the, the foresight to start to interview more and more um, leaders and stakeholders across the organization. What they found was um, by implementing some AI across the customer service workflow, they were actually able to impact the business much more effectively. And they aligned with a, a, a customer satisfaction an overall initiative to improve customer satisfaction. And what they did is they, they said, well, actually it's a backend facing application, not the prettiest. It's our customer service folks that use it, but by um, understanding and collecting all the data for customer sentiment across, you know, across the internet, but also um, even like voice recognition to see how well they're engaged, they started to prioritize where customers were um, in the call queues and started to be able to give them different incentives and vastly improve um, the, the customer satisfaction scores. So they, they, they took the time. I think what we see is most companies, because of these pressures, just want to jump right in. I would say take the time, understand the business, and align with the, the overall business initiatives, and you have a better chance of success. And when you do succeed and you, you build the champions internally, um, then you'll start to, to be able to address other problems, right? You've shown success with AI within your organization, and then you'll get more support across the entire you know, executive and, uh, and, and stakeholder uh, folks to, to do more with AI. Thank you, Tarek. How about you, Doug? What's your answer to a business strategy first situation? Thanks, Teresa, and, and, and thanks for the diving tour. That was uh, <laughs> definitely the coolest um, Zoom call I've had this week or this month or this quarter. Um, well, I, I think we can learn a lot from the way we used to develop software 30 years ago and custom software started hitting uh, big companies. Back then it was common to write 200 page requirements documents and throwing them over the wall and cross your fingers for 18 months. And, you know, don't, don't um, disrupt the developers. We're not sure what they do or how they do it, but uh, let them do their thing. Well, like you said, most of those projects aren't working now and they never generate any value. Um, that didn't work then and it's, and it's not working now. So what I like to do is short ideation workshops to get the business and the AI team aligned on expectations. Um, analogy I use is if you went to your 15 year old son and said, hey, what kind of car do you want for your birthday? You'd probably get a different answer than um, uh, is safe. And same thing's happening with AI. There was a bank in Singapore a while ago that uh, got into AI and they went to uh, a large global uh, consulting firm from upstate New York from you know the first half of the previous century and spent millions of dollars trying to build a robo-advisor for their wealthy clients. Well, humans aren't even good at wealth advising. 90% uh, of hedge funds don't beat the market in the long run. So why they thought they could build an, uh, uh, an AI system that could... Um, I uh, could advise people when, when humans aren't even good at it. it was beyond me. So they wasted tons of money. But then they found another problem, which was refreshing ATMs. Um, boring little problem of refreshing, the, uh, restocking the cash in an ATM machine. Um, and they used AI to predict when each different machine needed to be restocked with cash. And they got outages down from four per year to one every 55 years, which is a 99% improvement. Now, I know there's a lot of data people on this call, so you're saying, well, that's easy, Doug. Just visit every machine every two hours and you'll get no outages. Well, they reduced outages 99% and reduced trips by 10%. So big saving in customer experience. Um, like Tarek said in his example, focusing on, on customer experience rather than what seems sexy to you. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where you can generate a lot of value quickly. Absolutely. Well, Kelly, thank you, Doug. And Kelly, uh, with HashMap, I'm quite sure that you have to talk a lot of people out of projects from this business first kind of strategy. So talk to us a little bit about when you walk into a company, what do you say about a business first strategy to them? Yeah, no, thanks, Teresa. And uh, great, great comments from Doug and, and Tarek as well. Agree with all those. I think that, you know, when we look at it and, and the guys mentioned it, I mean, technology is one part of the equation. So your AI, ML technology, 
uh, people process. And as, as the guy said, getting to what is really important, what's that outcome that you're really trying to drive, technology will be one piece of it. I think starting with a technology mindset sometimes, which I think we're all prone to do, can mm -hmm. certainly lead us down a little bit of a, a rabbit hole. We're all pretty highly opinionated in that area. And you get a, get a few technologists in a room together that, are, that don't have an eye on those business outcomes. It can, it can get ugly. So um, I think, you know, we, we also look for, uh, you know, we, we think about this notion of potentially build it and they will come. But mm -hmm. I, I just feel like today people are not waiting. Uh, they're just not waiting around. We don't have patience anymore for these long drawn out outcomes. I recently had uh, Boris Japez, who is CEO at Census. They're a uh, they're reverse ETL uh, solution. He was on our podcast, uh, HashMap on Tap, and he talked about the notion of we we're talking about minimum viable product and uh, you know getting to market quickly, getting your data product to market quickly, getting your AI product to market quickly. But he talked about this notion of building a shed, a house, or a cathedral. And you know we, we can tend to go down that uh, house cathedral route when really we should be focused on, as Tarek and Doug were talking about, let's get something done for the businesses. Meaningful, has a high impact. Uh, maybe it has a pretty just uh, generic uh, algorithm associated with it. But if it drives high value, it may not be the glitziest. Let's, let's go do it. Uh, one of our, one of our uh, consultants explained it like this. If you have to focus or, or you need to focus the initial discussions on the why of the project, not so much the how. And of course, again, as technologists, we love talking about the how, but kind of raise that conversation up a little bit. Uh, one, one great example that I have that I, that I love, uh, we're working with a healthcare organization. And this is one of the few times this has happened. Walked in the door, they said, uh, Kelly, you, you, HashMap, you guys need to help us spend more money. Kind of looked around, wait a minute, are you actually talking to me? You want me to help you spend more money? They had a, they had a challenge with having their data in a place where they could actually make decisions off of it around uh, paid ad and paid social. And they could go get more money. They knew it was working. They just didn't quite know why it was working and where they should deploy that additional budget. And so, you know, the data just wasn't in a state where they could make decisions. And, you know, you can have the greatest algorithm uh, going, but if the data is not where it needs to be, those are going to be, you know, kind of meaningful. So I think defining that actual business value of an outcome it's easy for us to say. Sometimes it is more difficult than it, than it looks, but I'd say, Try to find that as you as you kick things off, aligned to that business value. Yeah, those are great, great examples. And thank you very much for that, Kelly. I just have this image of moving a cathedral to a cloud. You know, I'm, I'm try, trying to get that out of my mind. I, so I, this I, comes I, back because cloud is the biggest thing out there. Everybody wants to take their data, move it to the cloud, do something with it really exciting. So Tarek, since Snowflake is the cloud sort of uh, partner that we have that is the most important part, tell us a little bit about why people want to move to the cloud and why, what's the benefit of doing so? Yeah, definitely, Teresa. I think you know, we're all very well aware that unlocking and tapping into data is, is how we're going to transform and modernize our businesses. And, and those that have done a great job and have used data wisely are gaining competitive advantages already and, and in, re in return generating more revenues. Um, so leveraging the cloud is critical for all of these data and AI initiatives. And uh, if you look at a Gartner study, I think it showed that 85% of businesses are going to adopt a cloud first strategy in the next four years. And so why is that? I think if you look at the key elements of the cloud, first, you've got this, this concept of almost near unlimited scalability. So you can, at the click of a button, you can increase uh, and, and decrease resources on the fly, right? Those, whether they're computer storage resources, um, you can scale out, you can scale them back in, um, you can even suspend them um, in certain cases. And so no longer are you required to, to have that upfront capital spend on infrastructure to support all the different applications. You don't have to also design um, or over or under provision. And so this gives you this, this interesting uh, capability, especially with the vast amounts of data that we're dealing with. And you need the vast amounts of data, you need to capture more data sources in order to actually have a, an effective and successful AI strategy. How do you get your arms all, all around this? Um, so it's critical to have this, this, this kind of scalability. And that scalability also lends itself to making you more agile, 
as an organization. You're no longer having to wait provision equipment and, um, and, and then having to go and purchase more if you run out of capacity in certain areas. Now, it, again, you can leverage this elasticity of the cloud so you're not limiting your, your data scientists and your engineers and your analysts and your developers. Um, so you're, you're starting to be able to go really fast as, as an organization, be agile and respond to the different demands of the business. With that scalability, you also get this economic advantage too, right? I think, again, I mentioned the elasticity of the cloud. You're paying for what you're using. And so now you can align directly with the business. Again, not over-provisioning, not designing for the peaks and then having all this unused capacity uh, throughout the rest of, rest of the year, right? Um, and uh, there's obviously economic advantages with, with switching to, to um, op operational expenditures versus, versus CapEx. But because you're dealing with this vast amount of data now, different kinds of data, um, the rate at which that data is created is, is ridiculous. Um, so how do you make sure that you can capture all this and not have to make trade-offs? Well, and scalability allows you these economics. Uh, the, the third part is uh, the ability to make data accessible and mobilize data so you can have this, this massive collaboration, right? Um, again, we're dealing with a lot of data. We're dealing with um, many different business groups that are spread all over. Now everyone's remote. The cloud opens up these opportunities to easily access that data across the organization. So now data scientists and engineers and business users can all share that data they can easily view process across across the cloud, which means across the organization, and they can provide inputs, real-time updates from anywhere, anytime. There's also some reliability and, uh, and business continuity advantages too that you don't have to take care of um, as, a, uh, as a business, right? Let, let the technology, the, the cloud vendor, uh, the technology, the cloud technology provider handle that. Um, and this critical need to adopt the cloud for strategy has never been more evident than, than during this COVID epidemic. I think companies more than ever now realize that they have to digitize their business. They've got to provide that real-time collaboration that I just spoke about uh, for this remote workforce. And they've got to op optimize their spend, especially their capital spend. The cloud allows them to achieve all of this and be better prepared for the future. That's fantastic. Thank you. I'm not sure I'd always thought of all those different reasons. Cost, I think that's the first thing people think about is that you can make that wherever the cost is gonna fit you best. So thank you for that. We're gonna do a poll real quickly since everybody is so uh, used to these polls. Um, if you participate in the uh, poll, there is a click on the website here that you go to it. And we're gonna ask you just, just from your perspective, which of the following best describes your state of data? Since all of, all of these things in artificial intelligence takes tons and tons of data to really work, the choices for you are scattered in databases across the company, siloed but well-organized, centralized in a data warehouse or a data cathedral, we should have put that one in Kelly, or centralized in a data lake or virtualized in the cloud. So we're going to see what your answers might be. That's the number one. That's the number one answer. Is everybody entered? Well, thank you. Scattered across the company is usually the answer that we hear from a lot of our customers. Uh, so that being said, if you can't get your data in shape in order to do all of these things, you probably are not gonna be able to do artificial intelligence. So what kind of a partner, Kelly, do you look for to get your data straight or to help you put that data in a place where you can access it, whether it be that shack or the cathedral, what are you doing? Yeah, no, great, great question, Teresa. I think it's, you know, again, it's, it's easy for us to, to sit up here and talk about this. And, and I think you got to get real practical about how you do this. When you, I think when you look for a partner, you look for a partner that really is well-versed in all aspects of call it the data life cycle. Uh, I would say look for a partner that's vendor neutral. If you have a partner that's only aligned with one vendor, say Microsoft or AWS or you know, GCP or whatever it is, you're going to get a pretty opinionated answer around that one solution set uh, versus what may be best for you, which could be a third-party ecosystem solution uh, like a Data IQ or a Snowflake. So just be careful of that. Um, I'd say when you look at that data lifecycle, so acquisition, 
Uh, there are so many different data sources, like, like uh, Tarek was talking about earlier, where you've got on-prem sources, you've got cloud sources. How can I effectively get this into one consolidated place? You just ran the poll that said everybody is, is dealing with tons of data silos scattered out right now. How can I put that in a place where I can really use that effectively uh, from wherever that source is originating? And how can I get it as close as possible with those data pipelines into a fully automated, fully managed type state where I'm not having to deal with all the heavy lifting around that. You know, tra data transformation, enrichment, getting that data into a curated usable state. We talk a lot about uh, trusted and usable. And to me, those are two really, really key things. If I can't get that, you know, out of my data set, then it's, it's, it's kind of useless. So, you know, storage compute, I was thinking, you know, as it relates to Snowflake, and, and, and choosing a, a partner in particular, um, you know, choosing a services partner, choosing a solution. I think it's also good to look at how many different workloads could a particular technology support? I look at consumption and, and applications. I think data science, I think data sharing, data engineering, which all play a part in this AI ML space, but I'm gonna need a data lake workload. I'm gonna need a data, you know, maybe new net new data applications, data products that are being developed. And of course the old standby BI and data warehousing. So if I've got a, a, a technology solution that supports a variety of workloads like Snowflake does, I think that's gonna be really Really, really helpful. Um, last component in that data life cycle would be the automation side of things. So how do I incorporate DevOps, data ops principles? How do I manage my source code? How do I do version control around that data product life cycle so that it's sustainable and, and automatable and, and fully uh, replicatable, I guess, going forward? So we look at, um, you know, from a partner standpoint, we look at what's really resonating with customers right now is a, a 7S type approach, Teresa, to design where you say, and I'm not mm -hmm. going to go into a lot of detail here for sake of time, but simplicity, speed, speed to impact, by the way, speed to impact gives us all relevancy as a partner, as a provider of data services within your organization, as a technology provider like DataIQ or Snowflake. So speed to execution, speed to impact, speed to value, sustainability, uh, self-serve, that comes up every single time uh, from a design standpoint, scalability, security and savings, which the team talked about earlier. So um, those at a high level, I think, look for those types of aspects uh, with a partner. I'd say lastly, uh, do you have, does that partner inspire confidence? Do you feel like they've d been there, done that, done this before, planned and orchestrated out this type of solution uh, multiple times? Uh, do you feel like they're going to be an accelerator for you? I mean, if I can't do it faster with a partner, why bring a partner in? I'll just do it myself, mm -hmm. right? Uh, are they focused on my success as, as a customer as well? Again, kind of that honest, unbiased assessment of what I should be doing, not tainted by having to go down a certain uh, product path. And then I, I think, a lot, lastly, I think a lot of customers really enjoy the experience of getting that mentoring and coaching along the way, kind of that joint hands on, not just doing something as a partner, but how did you do it? Why did you do it? What were you thinking about? What were those options? What were the perspectives, pros and cons, all those, those types of things. So a few thoughts there, Teresa, around selecting great. a partner. That's, that's really great, Kelly. Thanks for that. That's really practical advice. We really appreciate it. So one of the things that we do, we've talked about the data, we've talked about the partners to put it into the cloud and to manage it. Now you've created an algorithm and you hear these stories about algorithms either produce great results, but then over time deteriorate or they don't produce any results at all. So Doug, take us through. Data IQ is the expert in managing or at least our expert partner in managing the AI ML ops process. And why is it important to govern that? What do you tell people they should look for? Sure, sure. Yeah, this is one of the biggest changes that's, um, that differentiates AI from BI, for example. Um, you could think of a really good AI model as a new kind of worker that is a thousand times more productive than your best business analyst. So instead of doing, uh, uh, you know, uh, fraud detection on 10 accounts a day, they do fraud detection on 10,000 accounts a day. 
Um, if you had a worker like that, you'd probably have to change your hiring and firing and supervising processes. Maybe go from annual reviews to hourly reviews. Um, another analogy is think of a dragster versus a, a Subaru Forester. Uh, they're both pretty safe, but one has an automatic fire suppression system built in that goes off in a millisecond. And um, That's the Subaru, and, right? <laughs> not yet. Yeah, that's right. The Subaru. <laughs> Maybe the Tesla. Uh, it was an incident <laughs> recently. Uh, um, 30,000 gallons of water to keep that thing. Going. Anyway, so um, you think of ML apps as like the fire suppression on a dra dragster. You don't need it very often, but when you need it, you really need it. So let me go into more detail on two reasons why ML apps is so important. One is time to market and the other one is risk while in market. So time to market is critical for models because most of the predictive models have a half-life for their predictions. The, the value of their predictions uh, decays over time. And, you know, that should be, you know, pretty intuitive. If, if you're trying to predict if somebody's buying a couch and you can predict it accurately, well, that's good for two or three weeks. If they're buying a house, that might be good for a month or so. Um, there's a lot of predictions that are good for just a few seconds because the customer is going to be gone or the bid for the supply chain is going to be changing. Mm -hmm. Years ago, I built a model for Mother's Day for merchandising on a big e-commerce site. I was so proud I got the model done three weeks before uh, Mother's Day, handed it off to a separate testing team. Um, they took a few days to test it, handed it off to DevOps, which at that time we didn't call DevOps. We, we had no idea how it got from what we did to the website <laughs> or to the, to the call center. Anyway, so the model went into production on the Friday before Mother's Day. Well, back then shipping was four days. And so the model was totally useless and there was no value whatsoever. Uh, other example is, is a, a large department store I used to work with. They used to lock down their website in October so that the website wasn't changing very much during uh, the holiday season to minimize risk. Well, they also like to test new models for a month. So you, you take a lockdown in October, testing for a month. They asked us to do the models for Christmas in, in August. Well, consumer behavior changes quite a bit between uh, August and, and Christmas. So again, those models were 100% uh, useless. That, that particular um, uh, three-letter uh, department store has uh, lost 98% of its market cap since then. Uh, so the, the, the industry average is about three to six, um, a few months to get a model into production. Uh, it's, it's still, we think, way too long with, a, um, with, a, uh, with an AI platform, an end-to-end -end AI platform. You can get that down to much, much shorter. The, the state of the art with companies like Netflix and Amazon, which, which largely invented continuous uh, integration and continuous development. It's, it's six minutes. A developer at Netflix can build a model, test it in their workbench, um, and then release it to live traffic in, in just a few minutes. Another reason that uh, time to market is so important is to avoid cascading errors. As we move from hundreds of models per company to hundreds of thousands of models per company like a number of our um, big customers have. It's just not feasible to release them all at once like we used to do with package software. You have to trickle them out at different rates to avoid cascading errors and unintended interactions between them. Uh, the second reason uh, ML apps is so important is to reduce risk while the model is operating in market. Um, there's some big examples of this uh, the past 20 years. The, in, in the fall of 2008, for example, working with a credit card company here in, here in the Chicago area, and the models predicted that for a certain customer segment, um, one out of 1,000 customers would be 90 days late on their credit card payments. So 90 days delinquent, which is, which is one of the key models in that industry. Well, what we were seeing in real time and real behavior, not projected behaviors, one out of 20 of those people was 90 days late. 
So the, the model was off by a factor of 50. Those, those models had 95% confidence interval, which for most things in our life is pretty good. 95% accuracy uh, for a lot of things is pretty good. But the other side of that coin is 5% of the times it's wrong. So when, when that's evenly distributed across our customer base, our customer segments, and evenly distributed across long periods of time, 5% is not so bad. But when it comes all at once, either in one customer segment or in one uh, supply chain area or in one time period, it can have uh, catastrophic effects. Um, and that's what happened in the fall of 2008. Uh, one of the economists I was working with on that project said 95% accuracy means um, once every 20 years, we're gonna be really wrong. And he said, I guess it's this year. Uh, and it was, it was uh, the whole industry just shut down until they could figure out what was going on. So there's a lot of behaviors that are very sudden. And everybody knows about it. You lock the doors and go figure it out. And there's a lot of behaviors that change and we know about it ahead of time. Like Mother's Day changes, you know, flowers and candy, just guarantee we're going to sell a lot of flowers and candy the next two weeks. Um, and uh, Christmas, I mean, that's the, those behaviors are 100 years old. Everybody knows they're coming. And we change our supply chain and our merchandising and everything to fit those. It's, it's the slow changes, the insidious slow changes that are tenth of a percent at a time and that accumulate over time that are the most dangerous. And ML ops, uh, when done well, is detecting those um, uh, as they accumulate. An example of that was in February, there were some snowstorms in Texas. Now I live in Chicago where it's cold seven months of the year and didn't have much sympathy for my friends in Texas. <laughs> but the unintended consequence of that was there were supply chain disruptions in many industries um, weeks and weeks later. And if models were built uh, assuming certain um, supply chain characteristics, those models decayed pretty fast when the, when the snowstorms uh, had a ripple effect. So ML ops is important for three big reasons. Um, time to market to avoid cascading errors, detecting the drift on the inputs to the models because the models learn from, from the past. They don't adjust automatically. And then um, uh, monitoring the, uh, the drift in the output of the model like uh, happened in, uh, in the fall of 2008. That's really important. Thank you, Doug. We're going to ask the audience now, because you said something really important. You said speed to market. And we're going to ask the audience if they've done these kinds of projects before. Tell us how long it has taken you to get a model into production. Less than a week, two to six weeks, seven to 12 weeks, and more than 12 weeks. So if you will do your at your chat box right now and take that uh, survey, we will display the results for you. And we've got to have more than one person respond here, guys. And if you've done less than a week, please leave your name and number so we can call you and figure out how you did that. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Give everyone a second this time. I think we all got to get out yeah. and chat. <laughs> I feel better about it. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Well, that is kind of, that's kind of indicative of where we are is that we're sort of in the infancy of doing all of these things with artificial intelligence, whether it's making sure that it's secured in the cloud and our cloud and our data is ready to embrace it, or even just managing it once we get it out there. So this question is gonna to go to the entire team, please. Um, how do you help customers? If we start back to that business first strategy and the business first strategy has got to have an outcome. How do you help customers think about the ROI of the investment for artificial intelligence? Cause it's not a small investment. It's an investment, not just in money but in psyche and change management and everything else it takes in the organization to make it work. So we'll start with Kelly. Tell us, Kelly, how, how do you talk about ROIs on AI investments? 
Yeah, no, thanks, Reese. I'll, I'll take kind of a, again, a practical cut at this one. I, I think Doug alluded to it a while ago. We generally will start with a use case enablement workshop. I think Doug talked about ideation workshops. You, you, you know, even if there's a lot of uh, a lot of dollars, a lot of budget allocated towards AI and ML type projects, data projects, you still want to align the opportunities you have within your organization, those use cases that you believe have that high perceived value with whatever risk is associated with that. And again, the last thing that we want, we talked about speed earlier, is I'm going to do this perceived high value thing, huge executive wow factor that I just never get to market. So we worked with um, worked with a manufacturer, a large manufacturer recently, and did, did our best to really try to align with what they said was important out of the gate. I'm not going to go into all the detail, but it was th think about things like manufacturing optimization and innovation and all of the different subcategories that fall into that design and customer service, supply chain and operational efficiency. And when you start looking at the use cases and kind of aligning in a, in a matrix to the risk and the associated value, you start getting a really clear picture of, you know, what are those two or three things that I could do relatively quickly? I've got the data for, I, I feel like I've got a reasonable approach to a model on, uh, that's that's going to get me to a, a um, you know a solution and an outcome that's going to let me do more down the road. So, you know, obviously there's there's maybe a cost play in there, but th those innovation plays get a lot more executive attention. Um, sometimes, you know, moving the timeline out a little bit more, is it worth the wait? Those are decisions that, you know, we usually help work through in that uh, use case enablement workshop. So uh, I would say that's, that's a great place to start. There's all different versions of that, but to start aligning on ROI, TCO, I'd say get down into that practical level of really looking at detail uh, around those use cases and then prioritize those. Okay. Great. Uh, I wanted to let everyone know we've got about five minutes left in the breakout, uh, and we've got a good question from Alec in the chat. If anyone wants to take that on, perhaps Doug. Yeah, the question, guys, is uh, for firms that are doing near real-time model development, how do they mitigate the QC risk of deploying things so quickly? Is there an experimental experimentation framework that they use in any way where new models are getting a small part of the traffic and then compare the models results to see which models are the most performing the best. Exactly, exactly. Um, the, I, I used to run the product recommendation team at Amazon and the, uh, we used to have arguments almost every week, what's more important, the model or the experimentation techniques that help us find um, what actually works. And um, the, AI deprecated half of the people went and said it's experimentation. Half of the people went, it's both. You, ha you absolutely need both. Um, the ACM had a great uh, conference, uh, video conference about eight years ago where one of the chief architects from um, Netflix explained their whole system. And it was just breathtaking. But yeah, it, it's exactly what you said. They, they can put in a new model. It'll get a 10th of a percent of the traffic and the system automatically regulates it. And then once a month they go around and they kill all the models that, got, that are getting zero traffic, basically. They just, you know, the system automatically retires the bad models. Thank you very much, Doug, for that answer. And thanks for the question, whoever asked that question. I'm gonna go back to Tarek for just a second and just tell us, you know, in your estimation, what are the return on investments for this cloud and data thing that everybody's got out there? Yeah, thanks, Teresa. I think you go back to, to Kelly's comment about aligning the business because when, you, when you're when you looking at leveraging AI and machine learning, you're, you, you've got a, a few different parts of the business that you can you can attack, right? You can go and look at how do I increase revenue, maybe um, address some marketing use cases, or um, I can I can look at decreasing costs on, on the operations side. I can look at risk mitigation. I can look at... Um, you know, uh, innovation, which is even harder to measure because you're getting a competitive advantage. Um, going back and aligning with what are the overall business initiatives, right? What is the CEO actually outlined out to the to the market that um, that, that the company is going to achieve uh, this year to be more competitive? And once you align to that, obviously, then you're 
you're meeting the business goals, you're building the internal champions, um, and, and you're going to have that direct impact. So I think the, the biggest thing from an ROI perspective is, um, you know, attack the, the top priority items that you can with the simplest use cases, right? And, and fail mm-hmm. fast if you have to, right? When, you, when you're, I think a lot of times what we do is we're, we tend to want to build out these the technology and start to attack the problem. And if we're not making an impact, um, you know, it's 12 months before we, we realize it. So go after the right business initiatives and then um, whatever's not working, just be able to adapt quickly so you can have this, the quick success. I think a lot of organizations just don't achieve the quick success, spend a lot of money, a year goes by or, or more, and then um, it, it's hard to go and, and, and ask to go take on another uh, AI initiative because um, there's been failure and there's no there's there's a loss of confidence there. Yeah. So, yeah, align with the business initiatives. Okay. Well, thank you very much, all of you guys. I I can't say enough about how wonderful it is to have partners like HashMap and Snowflake and Data IQ cooperate in this kind of a discussion. I really really appreciate it. We all know that data fuels digital, it fuels AI, it fuels everything we want to do. And thank you for showing up today to talk about making that real, because we hear about all the wonderful things AI does. We don't always hear about how difficult it is or the things that you need to consider. So what NTT Data wants to do is to pull all of this capability together to help our customers. Our goal, like we said, is to make AI to democratize it throughout the organization. Thank you so much for your time today. We uh, really appreciate it. And thank you for being part of this shark dive experience that we've had as well.